it was always at the back of my, our minds that, you know, this is our home and why did we have to go? Why were our houses being burned? Why were we kicked out? Essentially, it was heaven and hell for me. That's basically all I can put it down to. In, in order to save your lives, you had to go or you'd be killed. Going from that to being welcomed in the most humanly amazing way you can probably think. Yeah, it was just, it, it was unbelievable. It was actually unbelievable to, you know, for us, it, we'd never really thought of going and living anywhere else. There's people who, you know, aim to go and live somewhere or prepare to go move into another country. We had no such thoughts. We'd always, we'd, Kosovo was all we'd known. Kosovo was all we ever wanted, really. We'd never wanted to leave. We had no reason to leave up until we were kicked out. <laughs> The Kosovo War was actually not an isolated event. Uh, it was rather an outcome of a long-term um, dispute, tensions and claims over Kosovo, as well as strained relations between uh, Serbs and Albanians. Serbian claims over Kosovo are rooted in a, a strong nationalist narrative and a historical myth which dates back to the 14th century, to the Battle of Kosovo, uh, according to this myth, Serbs were defeated by the Ottomans. It came to be seen as the most relevant and most fatal event in Serbian history. As such, it has been reproduced uh, in uh, 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 epic songs, literature in, uh, by Orthodox clergy, uh, Serbian academia, diplomats, as well as uh, politicians. Kosovo nije jedan običan deo Srbije. Kosovo je samo srce Srbije. Čitava naša istorija je na Kosovu. Svi naši manastiri su na Kosovu. Serbian uh, leader uh, Slobodan Milošević started making use of this narrative about Battle of Kosovo. So he was attending the, for instance, the 600th anniversary of, of the battle and was, held, was uh, making really uh, nationalist speeches which involved a lot of ethnic hatred. Ta je situacija tamo bila neizdržljiva. Ljudi su bili potpuno obespravljeni. Mi nikad nismo imali uh, u vidu da uh, bilo ko u ovoj zemlji sme da bude diskriminisan. Milošević je rekao da treba da se nešto promeni. Jer vlast drže dole šitari. Srbi ne mogu, nemaju nigde u vlastima, sve su ih učistili. A osnova bile su ingerencije koje je pokrajina imala, imajući praktično status republike i sve poluge vlasti u rukama da sprovede jedan takav, rekao bih, čist nacistički cilj. After revoking the, the status of autonomous province, uh, Milošević uh, uh, imposed a martial law uh, on Kosovo. So, uh, which lasted almost a decade, from you know, 89 until the end of 90s. This uh, state of uh, emergency um, was a de facto apartheid system based upon ethnic segregation, 
uh, and state-sponsored uh, state violence against the Albanian majority. So through this law, the structural violence uh, and the exclusion of the Albanian majority from political, economical, social and public life became, uh, became legitimized. The strategy of, of Albanians at the time was uh, endurance until independence. And it actually led to a state in embryo. So they had their own elections, etc. But of course, that was not recognized by the rest of the world. But the aspiration for independence were, were already there since many years. After almost a decade of, of, of this, things weren't getting better. So in some ways, the system became to be seen as not really effective in keeping this state-sponsored uh, violence uh, and exclusions from public life of, of uh, Albanian majority. Uh, so this low intensity war of the 90s uh, exacerbated the already uh, difficult position of Albanian rural population. Uh, so an, uh, another fraction started emerging from there, from those regions, uh, and that is Kosovo Liberation Army. And that also was a overturn from Kosovo Albanian focus on patience and, and endurance to an open confrontation with Serbian forces. When the fighting started, I think I was about 12 when, um, or 12 or 13 when um, the first kind of contact with the, the whole violence of it. The first kind of thing that I remember was um, a row of tanks coming into our town. You know, it, very early in the morning, we were all woken up by the noise and we were asking all these questions, you know, what, what's going on? And no one could really tell us what, it, what was happening. Our parents had no idea. No one, everyone was in the dark. Now, I lived in the capital of Pristina, which was probably the, the, the least affected in, 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 in a sense. The uh, paramilitary Serbian troops um, visibly started to come into the buildings and empty the flats, empty the apartments. So what I mean by that is literally ethnic cleansing. So we, they would come in, knock on the door, if you are Albanian, leave, get out. Doesn't matter where you're going, you are leaving Kosovo. That was basically the message. From, for about two years, we were moved from place to place. Um, we, were, we were kicked out of our flat in, the, in, the, in a small town that where we lived, where we moved to. And then um, we went back to the farm. Um, we were kicked out of there. We went up in the mountains for a while. Um, when I say in the mountains, I mean in the mountains with a river, a stream running past. We could see all the burning kind of inst around us because we were right on top of our village so we could see our actual houses being burned. So then we were all kind of driven out, loaded into buses and driven out of Kosovo. So we went to Macedonia, some people went to Albania and we were put in uh, refugee camps. We went to one of the neighbours where we were our aunties I remember as a kid just looking outside of the front window and I can only describe as the sheer terror of what happened next which was just we're looking outside of the window and all we all we see is about five or six Serbian paramilitary troops um, like trucks um, I don't remember the, them being emptied and well then we were all walked out, all of us once the men had gone out, we'd gone outside in the front garden, 50 plus people if not more. Um, essentially when we got down, my, my, my dad and everyone else lying down on the floor, hands behind the head. Uh, we were made to do the exact same, including my uh, little brother, he was, as I say, one, two at the time. He was lying next to us, uh, surrounded by the police force. And obviously, as you would be, even as a kid, you're fearing the worst there, um, because you hear stories of this happening and people were getting executed in this, in this way. There is uh, documentation of a um, systematic and coordinated uh, campaign in order to kill, uh, expel, torture uh, uh, ethnic Albanians, uh, which was actually organized by the highest level of Serbian and Yugoslav state of the time. We don't know what or who or what call they got. I just remember my dad saying at the time they, they, they had a call from someone higher up, the main guy that was there. He was basically essentially told, release them. Uh, so they just basically 
um, told us to all get up, get in the cars, and essentially the first thing that had happened to us, but this time a bit more forceful, get out, leave, you don't belong here, you not you forget that this place exists. And we were made to kind of pay our way out as well, with either food or jewellery or money, if you had any. That's what we knew, we, that was it, we would probably never go back again. Um, we, we kind of, in our mind, we, they'd won, they'd got the land that they wanted, we were out, that was it. The deportation was actually a part of the ethnic cleansing campaign and it was on one of those attempts to permanently change the demographic and ethnic composition of Kosovo. So you've got many stories where people had walked for three, four days in order to get to a border but could, could not manage to. Rape was uh, used as a form of strategic war terror, so the estimate number of raped women is 20,000. And we're still dealing with, with this in a legal and political level. They weren't recognized as, as victims until 2013. To this day, there are uh, 1,000, around 1,400 missing persons. And this is a very painful part of war experiences because it's ongoing uh, and it's especially painful for the relatives of the missing persons. In March uh, uh, 1999 I lost uh, 13 members of my uh, close family and uh, myself and my cousin and two sisters and my brother were badly injured uh, by gunshot um, by gunshots in the war and then um, after the after NATO had intervened and the British army had entered Kosovo were offered uh, help in Pristina and then because of their condition we were offered to come to Manchester and then as I say we had we had no choice you know that was the 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 help we were offered and obviously we we were more happy to accept it during the liberation, um, a lot of particularly children and injured teenagers were evacuated to Manchester. So there was a government decision that people should be brought to Manchester. A lot of medical help was needed and obviously there was housing, housing and educational needs. And the government decided it should be Manchester. So we were already a charity that had been set up to support recovery. So that's what we did. So we got involved with the people who were brought, medically evacuated mainly, to Manchester in 1999. It was first the mobilisation of the community um, that, that was critical for them. Um, but they also wanted, you know, some practical help from uh, the council. And I said at that time, well, look, whatever's needed, we will do the best that we can to, to help. And I spoke to the leading councillors and officers and made sure that they were on board to offer help when it was needed. There was a lot of agreement politically and there was also a great deal of news coverage and there was a very positive coverage um, in terms of the dire needs of the people and the need to respond. In a sense, things were just being decided. I've, I've talked to political leaders and they just said, you know, we just decided in unison that we were going to do something. And then the detail was worked out later, like if we receive a lot of children, um, yes, who's going to fund it? say the leader of Trafford Council might think, is this going to be funded by Trafford? Or how are we going to deal with the financial aspects? And the same with housing. And that was all worked out um, after the decision to help. Sometimes they didn't even really know where they were coming until they were almost on the plane. We were loaded into this plane, all of us, about 300 of us, um, or more, I can't remember. And we were flown to Manchester. And as soon as we landed, the first thing I noticed was all the lights, you know, all the, all the street lights. I'd not, we had not had electricity for a while, so 
to see that was just it's like, why are they wasting all this energy on these street lights? <laughs> That's the, that was the first thing. And it's when we, we were coming out of the plane, there were people waiting for us, like on the tarmac, out, like outside of the plane. Just that absolute surreal emotion and overwhelming feeling of surviving what we just survived. Everyone making it alive as well. Uh, the very first morning, I remember opening the blinds and looking outside and seeing this park and seeing kids playing. That was the craziest feeling. That was something I can't really even begin to describe as a, as a, you know, I don't think that will ever be replicated as a feeling. If even if I lived another thousand years, it just it was it was just so crazy. Um, just to go from one absolutely dire situation and where you're afraid of basically dying any moment to peace and wake, you know, waking up early in the morning and just seeing a park and green and just the absolute opposite of what you basically essentially have gone through. Um, and we just, we didn't know what to feel, you know, we were all overwhelmed with all this kindness and all this love that everyone, people who we'd never seen, never met, they were showing us all this, you know, all these emotions and we were just like, what's going on? <laughs> but we knew we felt safe, straight away we felt safe, as soon as we landed. We just thought, right, that's it, I, my life is no lo lo longer in danger. We were welcomed by everyone. We received all the help that we needed. Um, I remember when we first moved into the center where everyone was saying we had the room full of toys and, was, and that was amazing, obviously, because uh, we were also traumatized from the war as well. So to have stuff like that was just amazing at that time. A lot of people came to Trafford where I live and we quite quickly were told about the children's presence here, particularly in schools, and we visited. And then we realised that on the doorstep there were a lot of families in Trafford, and the children in particular were in great need because they had had multiple bullet injuries and survived a massacre, and their dads were widowed. And so you had these motherless families, the mothers had been killed, trying to start a new life here in Manchester with very sick children and so obviously you know we became involved with those families it was just we were just really really well looked after and all the children we were all put in school in in normal school you know in the town's high school straight away i think it was about three months four months after arriving that we started um, i went straight into year 11 did my gcse's just like any other child the, the teachers in the school Amazing, absolutely amazing. At BT8, so Blessed Thomas Holford, um, which was actually a Catholic school. Um, now I say that because we weren't Catholic, none of us were Catholic, but we were welcomed in the absolute most perfect way. There wasn't an attempt to convert people, they were all respected. As the, I think every single one was a Muslim and they were respected as being of a different faith and there wasn't an attempt to proselytise, there was just an attempt to kind of love and give care. Obviously I didn't know any English back then so uh, while we were studying for our, preparing for our GCSEs we, took, we also had to have uh, English classes um, but we had our, our, own te like our own teachers and our own little room where we learned English as well at the same time so. So you learned English at the same time? Doing the GCSEs, yeah. yeah, yeah, and then I got about eleven GCSEs as well. <laughs> but that was only because obviously we we received more help and because we were learning English at the same time, so we had more time to prepare for the exams. Even to this day, I just think we're we're so lucky, we're so you know to be given a new life, basically. But to be honest, um. It, it was, it was great. It was just really, really good. I, we've never had a bad experience since we've been here. Essentially, they always made me feel welcome. They always made me feel as, as part of them. And they always made me feel that, you know, I was no different. Um, and I think that went a long, long way really for me because um, as I say at the time, maybe I might have not understood it, but um, 
now I certainly do and now I certainly see the bigger picture of what it meant um, for me as a kid to just feel normal and just get on with life really and not just me I think the rest of us as a group of friends that have grown up together through all that basically exactly what I've gone through but you know since we moved here. The press pre played a huge part in terms of educating us the people and the media played a really important role in terms of the messages that were received and the understanding that people had of the conflict in the Balkans. Even through freedom of information, it's quite difficult to actually get a, for a community to understand who's been brought to their community, where they are, what the needs are, how can they help, how can they respond. That's why I, I feel sorry for people that have to go through um, you know, what we went through and then uh, not being offered any help from anyone around the world and it's awful to see what's happening, you know, when you, when you watch the news to see what's happening to refugees, or especially around Europe, because obviously we, we know how hard it is to leave your country. No one leaves their country because, you know, they want to. They all do because, you know, it's the last resort, there's nothing else they can do. In terms of, you know, displacement, I just think anyone who's left their house where they grew up and, and moved into a different place, you know, whether it's by choice or they've been forced to do it, I think that the last thing they need is, you know, negativity towards that decision or, you know, they need a lot of help and support to, to be relocated into another place. And I can tell you what I've been through. I can tell you what, you know, as a, as a refugee, what I went through and what this country actually did for me and how it made me feel and what actually our lives or our daily lives actually look like. Don't be very hasty and very quick to jump. Because we are here, even though we had a massive tragedy during the war, because we are here, we managed to, you know, get justice for what happened to... Uh, uh, our family, we've managed with a lot of help from the, the community of Manchester, we managed to go back to our country and give something back to to our town, try and contribute and, you know, help uh, in my uh, hometown over there. I definitely would not want to want it us to turn our backs on, you know, that humanitarian crisis that was going on there. and. Um, so I just saw my role as leader of the council at the time to make sure that we were all on board. And, you know, it didn't take much persuading. It was an exceptional programme of resettlement because the receiving city, I can only talk about Manchester, was welcoming. It was welcoming. <laughs>